So this year I can't do a Guinness infused podcast. So instead, what I thought I would do is a show on the Troubles. And not just the narrow period of the Troubles, but the, the general history of Irish British relations, Irish nationalism, how it evolved, why, why it evolved. And, and not really as a, a history podcast. I'm going to do a little bit of that, but more about how this would relate to current events. Because after all, you know, we are, we're looking around and saying the world has gone insane. We're seeing all this crazy stuff happening. It's infuriating. People can get mad, you know, and you can vote as hard as you want, but it just gets worse. That is one of the lessons of the Trump years. You know, people were mad at the system and said, okay, we're going to vote for this, this crazy guy to send a message. And the message that the people in charge got was we have to clamp down on these people even harder. We have to do more insane stuff. And a lot of people in 2020, I, mean, I say a lot, I don't know what the number was, but I did talk to people that I know voted for Trump in 2016 who told me that they didn't vote for Trump in 2020 because they just got tired of the noise, the racket. You know, they were willing to put up with all the crap that would come from the Biden people being in charge just to be, just to have some silence of peace and quiet. It's an odd thing, but people vote for all kinds of weird reasons. And I, I'm going to guess that a fair number of people will want to vote for some of these other options out there just because they don't want to have to go through the agony of another uh, Trump experience. But also they don't want to be reminded by the fact that voting doesn't matter. But putting all that aside, there's a lot of things we can look at in the past and say, well, they're not really analogous to this age. They're not exact, but there's some parallels that are worth exploring. And I've used the Irish nationalism and the Irish revolt against British rule and all the things related to it. I've talked about this from time to time because I think, think it it really does offer a lot of good lessons to us because, you know, it's not exactly the same, obviously. You know, the, the United States hasn't been conquered in a sense by a, a foreign entity, a foreign country. But the way that our ruling class acts is very similar to how the British acted towards their Irish subjects and and really how any sort of colonial power operates. I mean, it's funny. In many respects, our rulers treat us worse than the colonial powers treated people in South America or in Africa. Not, not always. I mean, the Spanish and Portuguese were pretty nasty. The Dutch and the Belgians could be pretty tough. Uh, the Germans were actually quite nice to their subjects, uh, that, you know, the small number of colonies they had. And the British were actually pretty decent, too. Uh, but, you know, it's all relative, of course, to the age. But, you know, the stuff that we see going on now in the United States or in Britain, for example, the current British ruling class is much nastier to the native Brits than they were ever to the, uh, you know, to the Africans they ruled over or the Indians they ruled over. So the point is that there are parallels. Now, that doesn't mean that we get to copy the past or, or play uh, dress up and, and replay the past. You know, this is something I've talked about. You know, way too many people, in fact, most people are trapped in the 20th century still. They want to talk about the past as if somehow or other, if we talk about it enough, we can go back and relive it and start over. You know, all these guys, you know, the, the FBI has some new guys out running around waving, you know, whose flag around at LGBT events. And, you know, these guys are probably, I mean, they're idiots, for, but they're probably sincere idiots. They really think that if they dress up and they put on little outfits and wave flags and all this stuff, somehow magically they can recreate the events of interwar Germany in the United States in the year 2023. Now, again, they're morons, but it, people believe this stuff. They think that, oh, geez, we can go back and we can, we can re, re, relive these things. We can go back to our constitutional roots. We can go back to our old system. And, and you can't. But you, you can go back in the past, though, and find parallels and see how people may have succeeded or failed. And the failures are actually kind of important. And, and you know, how they dealt with similar kinds of circumstances that we're, uh, we're facing. So, you know, I just want to inoculate myself in advance against any criticism uh, about uh, talking about the past. Because I've, uh, lately I've been writing a fair bit about, uh, you know, the fact that we cannot think of you know, the present circumstances and say, well, let's go back to some point, you know, let's go do this or do that because all those things failed, obviously, you know, the post on Thursday was mostly about the fact that history is a system. You know, think of it as a system. It's a system of, of systems really interacting with each other. And the reason what we're in this spot that we're in is that all those things that we think are great about the past, well, they were part of what has brought us to this awful present. So you have to keep that in mind, but all right. So with all that, uh, the qualifications up front, what, what really happened in Ireland? Well, the first thing to know is that what's called the Troubles is a 20th century phenomenon, largely dated from the early 60s to the end of the 1990s. And then is when the, the, you know, they had all the, the Good Friday Agreement and all these peace settlements and largely settled the issue of Northern Ireland 
at the Irish Republic and the British role in Ireland in general. But all of this stuff goes back much, much further. Uh, this really started in the 17th century. What started to happen is British and English people started to settle in what we think of as now as, as Ireland. And they came in, they were called planters, and they had this old rule. It's called the sheet. And it's not the Lagos version of the sheet. It was the feudal version of a sheet. And basically what it meant was that land that was held under feudal tenure you know, to a manor or something like that, and if there were no legal heirs or claimants, well, then it reverted to the state or whoever the sovereign happened to be. So, you know, you have this piece of land and a lot of uh, land holdings and land rights were a bit more complicated than we have today. Today, you own a piece of land. The government says you're allowed to own it and uh, you can do with it what you want as long as you get permission from the government. That's technically ownership. Well, in feudal times, it's not that much different, but you could own a piece of land only for your lifetime. So the uh, lord or the king or whoever was, uh, you know, was the sovereign could say, well, you have rights to this land and all the peasants who are on it and maybe the, the woods, uh, you know, so you could harvest firewood or animals and game out of there or a waterway or something like that. You could do that for your lifetime. But then once you died, it reverted back to the king. So it didn't go to your heirs. But in many cases, it was heritable. So this grant that you got from the king, well, that would go to your, your children and then your grandchildren and so on and so forth. So there was different rules. Well, in, in Ireland, what they figured out, what the, the British uh, decided to do, was they started claiming all the land that did not have, an, or they couldn't be proven to have had an heir. And of course, they cheated like hell. So they were basically stealing the land from the Irish, giving it to wealthy and connected English and Scottish uh, landowners who would use it for you know the things that you use land for in that time, which was mostly farming. And of course, these landowners, they weren't there you know, busting their hump tilling the fields and tending the animals and fixing their barns and fixing fences and all that stuff. They were absentee landowners, so they owned the land. And one of the ways that they could corrupt the Irish society, of course, was to reward some Irish people to work for them as you know, overseeing their properties, their estates. And that was good for these guys, even though it was bad for the Irish people. And so this, of course, created, you know, the economic conditions immediately began to create social problems, cultural problems, because the English and the Scottish were Presbyterians and Anglicans, and mostly Anglicans, though. And, the uh, of course, the Irish were Catholic. And it, it, you start getting this conflict. And you actually had two wars in this period. And this lasted, according to the history books, I'm, I'm looking at a history page here on uh, the Ar history of Ireland, they date the this period from 1609 to 1791. So you're looking at almost 200 years of really low-grade conflict, the Irish would uh, revolt against something, and then the English would pass laws that made that kind of behavior not only illegal, but uh, gave them broad powers to seize the land of the people doing it and punish them harshly. You had things called the penal laws that uh, curtailed religious and legal activities amongst Catholics and any Protestant dissenters who questioned this kind of policy. So it really became a quickly became a religious war or a religious conflict. You know, these people who spoke the same language and occupied largely the same space, but were divided by religion, and that became a source of, of endless conflict. You had two wars during this period. You had the Irish Confederate Wars, which lasted almost 20 years, actually about a dozen years. And you have the Willamite Wars, which only lasted a few years. But in both cases, there were, you know, you get these arguments back and forth. But having gone to Catholic schools and heard the version, of, the Catholic version of these, you know, the Irish, the Irish, the English rather, instigated these kinds of conflicts that gave them a a cause to send in the army and put down the Catholics. And of course they won. And this resulted in the dominance of the Anglicans and the English in Irish society. But just because this sort of period ended with you know, a resounding victory of the English problems still existed. You had this long period all throughout the 19th century into the early 20th century, where you've got different groups of, of uh, Irish nationalists forming up. And, and it's an interesting thing because here's a good area to study to understand the dynamics of what happens when you have an alien uh, culture dominating a native culture. You get a lot of weird results. You, you get people who are in that native culture who are obviously looking to benefit from the, the arrangements. There's an opportunity here because after all, the people who are trying to rule over these people, they want friends in you know, amongst the people. That's helpful. Spies, collaborators, uh, people who just want to profit from it. If you ever seen the movie Michael Collins, I get into this a little bit. He was an, an Irish rebel in the late 19th century, early 20th century, who ultimately was trying to make a deal with the, the British. There was a, a lot of turmoil 
and there, there was this hope to have some home rule. That's actually what was called the home rule movement. Well, okay, you have this area of Ireland, Northern Ireland, it's dominated by the English and it's all Protestant. The rest of Ireland is, is Catholic. So maybe instead of, they can't get independence, but maybe they can get home rule. They can, for the most part, manage their own affairs. Autonomy. This is not a lot different, by the way, than what is going on in the Donbass right now. I mean, this history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but there are certainly themes here. The Russian-speaking people, who are the overwhelming majority of these provinces in what we call the Donbass, well, they wanted autonomy. They, they really weren't trying to break away necessarily, but the Ukrainians, of course, saw that as a potential threat, as a potential outcome. Because after all, if they get autonomy, then maybe they make a deal with the Russians and say, well, we want to join the Russians. What They weren't unreasonable in thinking that that could happen. And so guess what? You know, you have this conflict because one group of people, an ethnic group, wants autonomy and independence from the dominant ethnic group. Well, this is really what was going on in Ireland. And so you had this home rule movement, but there was a lot of violence during this period as well. There was a failed rebellion in the uh, end of the 18th century. You had a, sort of a low-grade guerrilla war that went on through the 19th century. But what was happening, of course, is that the cost of occupying Ireland was going up. It was becoming increasingly difficult for the British to maintain this stranglehold on this Catholic population across the Irish Sea from them. And also the English were suffering from, or Great Britain, the British Empire, was suffering from all sorts of losses all over the globe. The British Empire was in decline. So this should sound familiar. The British Empire is you know, is finding itself less and less powerful. And of course, the cost of maintaining this overseas possession seems to be going up. And so they did what was natural is that they looked to try and find some compromise. Okay, we can have home rule. We can allow some autonomy for the Catholics and that maybe that'll calm things down. But of course, once the Catholics got a little taste of freedom to say, well, these guys were willing to negotiate now. In the past, they were just shooting us. Now, well, things are different. Now they're willing to negotiate. So maybe if we keep the pressure on, they'll negotiate a little bit more. And it's a good example about how, you know, what we see going on in Ukraine, get back to that for a second, is that what the Russians are looking at in the battlefield is not in isolation. It's a part of this broader global negotiation that's going on, even though many of the parties, particularly in the West, are not quite r realizing that this is what's happening. It is what's happening, because after all, war is just an extension of diplomacy. Well, that's what the Irish understood. And of course, there was many people on the British side that understood this too. So you have these factions on both sides. And at any one time, one faction is going to be dominant over the other. So you get some more conciliatory uh, talk from both sides, and then you get some more hostile talk from both sides. So this kind of brews on for really most of the century until it really gets to a head at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to give a detailed history here. This is not a history podcast. This is, the whole point of this quick setup here is just to kind of give a broad framework for those who are not familiar with uh, the, the history of the Irish and British relationship and the Irish troubles and the Irish Civil War and all that good business. So anyway, so this starts to kind of come to a head. And you've got these, these people on one side, the Irish side, saying, look, home rule is fine, but we should have we should be independent. And then you have people on that same side saying, well, we can ease into this. We, we can go slow. So you have the fast guys, and then you have the slow guys. But both sides largely agree that the end result has to be independence for the Irish people which includes the Protestant areas. And that's obviously a big problem. It's still a big problem to this day. Of course, on the other side, you have the British trying to look at how, how are they going to manage this problem? You have one camp that thinks that, well, you know, there can be no compromises because if you compromise, they're just going to come back asking for more. They're not entirely wrong there. Then you have the, you know, there's other hardliners. And then you have the people who are looking to solve the problem and say, well, you know, what we'll do is we'll draw some boundaries and then we can, you know, if we can eliminate, say, Northern Ireland from the discussion, and then we can just negotiate with the Irish Catholics about what's left and their degree of autonomy and how fast it comes. Well, that'll be a peaceful and, and also a far less costly approach to dealing with this problem. So you got all these different sides fight, fighting internally with each other, but also fighting with each other and using this conflict back and forth to benefit their internal politics. And it's one of those great lessons that, uh, again, Michael Collins, the movie is a good good example, but you have all kinds of, there's a bunch of YouTube stuff on this too, where in any kind of struggle, whether it's the Bolshevik Revolution, whether it was the French Revolution, whether it's uh, you know uh, Mao's re revolt in China, you know all these revolutionary moments, these point, uh, periods of great turmoil, they have aspects to them. And there's you know the, the winning side is often the side that beats the competitors on <laughs> on the on the rebel side, 
and and not really this you know the guys who led the fight against the the people in charge you know that that was true of uh, the Russian Revolution. You know the Bolsheviks they were not responsible for overthrowing the Tsar. They just won the aftermath of overthrowing the Tsar. And and you see a lot of this in the, the with the Irish and the English. And you see those internal dynamics. We got better records and and a better understanding of it too. So it's a little bit a, a better example, I guess. Well, anyway, so this goes on. This has this process, and and that's an important way to think about this as a process. And eventually comes to a head for a number of reasons. One was the First World War. And this is an important piece of this puzzle. The Irish looked and said, why should we support the British crown in their fight against uh, the Germans and all these other people in Europe when they're our enemy? We should be on the other side. And then, of course, there were other elements that said, well, support for the, the, the crown during this great war. Well, that'll help you know gain benefits, gain trust and help build this slow process of Irish liberation. So you had that real big pressure. Of course, sending men to die in trenches is no small thing. So it added a, an enormous amount of pressure onto this whole process. And, and really, it came to a head with the Easter Uprising in Dublin in 1916. You can still, you can go there. It's one of the cool things if you ever go to Dublin. So you can see a lot of these markers around. And it's interesting for two reasons. One is it's obviously historically important. And, and it's, uh, you know, the stuff is right there. You can stand in the same spot, which really hasn't changed a whole lot in many cases, from when the events happened. You know, if you ever uh, travel in the South and you look at various Civil War battles or you see those signs that, you know, along a, a road that has a wooded area and say, and in this woods, this battle happened, it's, it's kind of neat. But the other part of it is, is that the average person living living in Dublin right now has already forgotten all this stuff. They're, they're completely blind to their own history. And I'm going to get to that a little later, but it, it is an interesting sort of thing to see that you can actually be in Dublin as an outsider, as an American, you know, visiting some of these these um, landmarks, and the Irish people who are there, they don't know any more about it than you do. <laughs> it really is. I mean, sometimes they know less, which is really quite incredible. But putting that aside, you have the the uh, the Irish Civil War, and then you have the Irish War of Independence. And I don't want to belabor this too long, too much longer. But the result is you have Northern Ireland is an autonomous area. You know, it's still part of the United Kingdom, but it has its own parliament. It has a lot of home rule. And it's largely a sort of a protectorate of the British crown. The rest of Ireland is now independent. But this is a huge problem because guess what? A lot of Catholics live in this area that is now controlled by unionists. So you have this population of Catholics, about 35-40% of the population, that identifies with the Irish part of Ireland and, of course, has been habituated to opposing the English part of Ireland. They're now trapped in this small sort of gerrymandered uh, unionist majority area and they're not happy with it, but they get that much they can do about it, at least initially. This is the deal that was made. And it's also, I think, why Michael Collins got killed, because you know a lot of Irish nationalists looked and said, look, you know, taking this compromise is really a violation of nationalist principles. And it's an important thing, I'll get back to this in a minute, about the problem with nationalism and where it can lead and, and the destructive ends it can lead to. You know, everyone thinks that nationalism is a pure good in and of itself, but we have lots of examples of where nationalism has turned out to be a suicide pact for the people embracing it. And you see some of it with uh, what happened with the Irish. So the result of this, though, I mean, it was a, a, a terrible conflict. Both sides wanted peace. And so they, they took a deal that wasn't really a deal that could work long term, but they took a deal because they, that's the deal they could get. And that's another one of those important lessons. And it's part of why there's a, going back to Ukraine, that we have a war in Ukraine. Prior deals were simply deals that were expedient at the time. And it turned out that they could in no way actually work because none of the sides really believed in them. You know, these Minsk agreements, there's Minsk one and Minsk, Minsk two. You know, we've now learned, according to uh, Angela Merkel and some of the uh, Western leaders, that that was just all fake. They did this to defraud the Russians. And of course, the Russians they're not going to say that, well, they, they really weren't willing to stop there, that it was just a stopgap measure, but that was probably true. They probably for a long time have looked and said, inevitably, these Russian-speaking areas will return to the motherland. And and so it was just a matter of buying time because no one really was in the mood to fight. And this is what you see here with, with the Irish and the British. It was it was time to have some peace, but you have this uneasy peace. No one's really happy with how this worked out. You have the people in Northern Ireland who are not happy with any of the arrangements. The Unionists don't like the fact that they've got all these Catholics who are causing trouble. The Catholics don't like being ruled by Unionists. You know, of course, you have the Irish Republic that looks and says, no, Northern Ireland is Ireland and it should be part of Ireland. Of course, the Unionists don't want that because they naturally assume, and probably correctly, that the Irish Catholics would drive them out, You know, have a pogrom against them. 
So you have that, that problem. And of course, the British weren't really all that excited about this deal either. They didn't like this arrangement, but it was the deal that they could get. That turned out to be the best deal they could get, so they took it. And that ended the, you know, the Irish Civil War, the Irish Revolt, and it also allowed the British to move on to other things. Because, you know, you have the end of the, the Great War, you have the interwar period, and of course you have you-know-who comes along in the 1930s. So you have, a, they have the British have other problems. But the intrinsic problems are still there. And so you end up with, you know, the this efforts by the Unionists to suppress the, the Catholics and, and deny them you know, the normal rights. I mean, the, there's no getting around the truth of it is that the Protestant majority in Northern Ireland was treating the Catholic minority as second class citizens and often worse than that. But, you know, the world had started to change things like human rights and minority rights and anti-colonialism. All of a sudden, these Irish nationalists are starting to figure out that, hey, we can turn the moral preening of elements of British society and Western society in general, we can turn that on them and start campaigning for things like civil rights. That was a thing that got going in, surprisingly enough, the 1960s in, in Ireland. And so you have these Catholics who are now casting themselves as victims of this Protestant majority backed by the British. And, and look, a lot of people in America, and I wasn't really around then, but you know, I was around through part of the troubles in the 1980s. And, and you heard a lot of people talk about this in the United States, that, hey, wait a second, how how are the British any different than any other colonizer? You know, the Irish deserve to, to be treated the same way as any other oppressed people. But I mean, we had congressmen in the United States who were organizing money for the IRA for you know, basically terrorist operations. There was a guy, uh, Congressman King out of New York, you know, he would host fundraisers for IRA leaders. I mean, you know, there's these weren't Sinn Fein guys. These were IRA leaders. These were guys who were leading, you know, terrorists, basically. And so there was a lot of sympathy for that. And they, they, they figured this out. The, you know, the, the Irish kind of figured out how to manipulate elite Western opinion to change the dynamics in, in the relationship between themselves and the uh, Protestant uh, majority in Northern Ireland, but also between Ireland itself and, and the English. And, and look, a lot of Americans are of Irish descent, too. So America being this colossus, a lot of what the IRA was up to was playing to an American audience. It was highly effective. That's why there's so many movies featuring the IRA. You, know, you go into um, like uh, movies of the like 70s and 80s. There's a ton of them, uh, you know, really sympathetic to the Irish cause. And there was a lot of IRA guys in the United States. I, I lived in Boston for a period, and people knew where they were. These were guys who were, you know, they weren't necessarily bombers most of the time, but they were in the United States hiding out. You know, they came into the United States so they could hide out, hide from the British. And they would live in a place like Boston and be a painter or a roofer or something like that. And just bide their time until things cooled down. And there was actually bars in Boston that were called IRA bars. And New York had IRA bars as well. So and probably Chicago, I don't know. But anyway, you have this long period, this 30-year period, where you have a revolt, a guerrilla revolt in Northern Ireland, backed by the Irish Republic and elements around the world, including people like uh, Gaddafi in Libya, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, there's all kinds of international intrigue to this. And they were uh, launching terrorist attacks against British targets, but they also launched against Irish targets as well. So if you were a collaborator, you were an Irish person and you were collaborating with the British, they might you know, take a shot at you or blow up your house or something like that. It was a lot of small stuff, but a lot of big stuff too, big bombings blowing up. Uh, they tried to blow up, I forget what the name of the hotel was, where Margaret Thatcher was staying. And they came close to blowing it up and killing her and her entourage. I mean, this was serious business. I mean, these guys were trafficking in very sophisticated arms, and it was a real guerrilla war. And eventually, though, the cost of of maintaining this stance by the by the British became too much, and inevitably they had to make a deal with the IRA and with the Irish. And and that's what happened. You get this end of it, really in the 1990s, there becomes this sort of effort to have a ceasefire and, and to start to negotiate rather than to continue to you know fight back and forth. There was a, a uh, an American senator, George Mitchell, who became sort of this special envoy of the United States to broker a deal between the Irish and the British. Uh, I remember he was on TV all the time when I was a young man. And eventually they get a, a process going. It leads to peace. You get these agreements. It was the Good Friday agreements, I think they were called. And you have the end of this of the trouble. So somewhere right around the the uh, beginning of the uh, of the 21st century, finally this long ethnic feud, this ethnic war that lasted for centuries, has officially come to an end. And by and large, it has. I mean, there, there's uh, still some elements that you know, every once in a while you'll hear some stories popping up of some Irish nationalists claiming that you know 
they're still fighting, you know, kind of like the Japanese in the Philippine jungles, you know, still fighting the war into the 70s. But by and large, the Irish political class is perfectly happy with the arrangements that have been made. It's good for them. They're happy with it. There's no elite support anymore for revolting against the British or attacking British interests or attacking even Protestant interests. So that all sounds all well and good. And that's a nice uh, what 30 minute summary of 400 years of Irish history. <laughs> and I know there's people out there who, uh, you know, who are early into this topic. And, uh, you know, I apologize in advance. I, I can't do a three hour show on this topic. I have to kind of condense things down. And the reason is I want to get to some lessons here. And, and really, if you don't know anything about it, you needed that 30 minute uh, preview in order to understand some of these lessons. But the first lesson here of the Irish conflict with the British is that identity is far more complex than biology. This is one of those things that our side gets tripped up on and that we think we, we fall for the gag that the that the bad guys always pull on us and that the bad guys always try to define the terms in such a way that benefits them. And then we argue about those terms. Racism is a perfect example. You know, a hundred years ago, you would be hard pressed to find anyone who could give you the slightest you know, clue as to what racism meant, that this wasn't a moral construct that existed. But the people in charge, they came up with this as a way to beat up the people that, that, that were opposing them. So they invented this whole new moral code. And our side keeps wanting to argue about this stuff. Um, the gender business, uh, uh, the um, uh, Ramsey Paul, he always points this out. Humans do not have genders. Gender is an inanimate object. Humans are mammals and we have sexes, we become a male and female. But because we'll engage in the use of language gender with the bad guys, we end up arguing on their terms. And, and this is the problem with, with identity. We, we tend to think of it as just skin color. You, know, you get people saying, oh, you know, your, your skin is your uniform. Well, no, it's not. And you see this with the problems between the Irish and British. You know, the, the, the British had a, an identity, a sense of identity that was based in history and religion, not biology. Biologically, the difference between the British and the Irish, not that much, not enough that anyone would have to worry about. And of course, these people lived in close proximity with one another for a very long time. Even during the height of the Troubles, you could know people who, you know, one side of the family was Irish Catholic, the other side was uh, Protestant, and yet they got along just fine with each other, somehow or other. So there was a lot of, a lot of things mixed up here. But we also see this today. We see white people leading this anti-white jihad. Well, it's because they don't think of themselves as white anymore. They're post-white. Because for them, whiteness is not a biological thing. It's a social construct. You know, your race is a social construct. So they've stepped out of that social construct into this new anti-white social construct. And they, you know, you have someone who is, uh, you know, English stock, you know, a person who's as waspy as the day is long, wagging her finger at regular white people about their whiteness. It sounds bizarre, but that's, that's the weirdness about identity. It's how you identify that matters. And, and history is an enormous a part, a part of it, as you see here with the Irish and British problems. But there's another aspect in that identity often has a negative component. You know, so a lot of what made up Irish identity, and I'm going to get into this at, at, towards the end, was not being British. You know, much of what plagued Northern Europe, or Northern Ireland rather, was simply the fact that one side was not British and the other side was not Irish. They weren't really anything. They didn't have something that they could say that, you know, this is who I am, independent of all other things. So much of their identity had come to be dominated by simply the rejection of this other identity. And that's powerful stuff. Hatred is a, is a great tool to use if you want to get a bunch of people to attack another group of people. And that's exactly what happened here. Of course, both sides saw themselves as irreconcilably different. That's, that's the other piece of that. You know, the Irish nationalists and the unionists simply saw themselves that there couldn't be any middle ground. They, they eliminated that possibility. You know, you had things like the Orange League that were made, that were created really to spite the other side. You know, they weren't done because they were pr promoting something or proud of something. They weren't, you know, they, they claimed that they were proud of being descendants of William of Orange. But really what they were doing is poking the eye, uh, finger in the eye of the Irish. But there's something else here. And, and this turns up over and over again. And this is something I, I recently posted up on Gab, and that is those who make peaceful separation impossible make violent confrontation inevitable. When people are sent, have a, a sense of about them that is different than other people, they can't get along with one another. Con, you know, conflict is going to be natural if they're in contact with one another. And, and that's fundamentally the problem you had with the Irish and the English. You had these two groups of people who identified completely different from one another, come into contact, 
that identity then gets warped into something more extreme that they're not just who they are, but they're who they're not, and they're forced into close proximity. You know, the problems in Northern Ireland, although they couldn't really be remedied with separation, although they could have probably have been, but what could have happened in Northern Ireland is say, well, look, we're going to draw some lines here in uh, Belfast. And if you're Catholic, you can't go to this other side. And if you're, you know, Protestant, you can't go to the other side. And that probably wouldn't have been practical, but, but you get the idea. You know, good fences make good neighbors. And this is something that we have to understand that's happening to us, is that this drive to force, say, diversity on your life is, a, is a, an attempt to try and create violent confrontation. The people doing this want to see chaos in the streets. That's why they were giggling with joy when Black Lives Matter was going on. They, they have the part of who they are, part of the anti-white mentality is this, this loathing, this bloodthirsty desire to see white people suffer. So, you know, they think Minneapolis, all white. So there's always black guys and anti-whites rioting and burning things down. They're all excited about it because that's what they want. They want that confrontation. They, they like the idea of it. Normal people say that's insane. You would want the opposite. But that's an important thing to understand is that much of what drives a lot of these conflicts is you have this element that sees profit in, in conflict and, and they do this on purpose. And that's certainly what we see with our ruling classes today. But we also see something else that I think is important for us in the conflict that the Irish and the British went through for all those years. And it turns up in other places. And I think one of the troubles that we have and it's sort of adopting this is that when it comes from an alien culture, something that's completely different than us, it's really hard to understand how to embrace it. I mean, even something like French Jacobin societies or Jacobinism, it's hard for us to relate to you know, different time, different place. But what you saw with the Irish is from the very beginning is the creation of secret societies. This became really the, the primary organizational method on both sides, both the Protestants and the Catholics. From the very beginning, there was this group called the Pipo Day Boys, which I always think is a great name. And I don't really honestly know a whole heck of a lot about them. They were opposed by the Catholic defenders. But what both sides were, were secret societies where average people organized themselves and said, look, we can't count on our authorities to always protect us because they're always going to make deals that are in their best interest. That was an important element here. In other words, the Protestants understood, the average Protestant living there, that the crown wasn't always going to step in and look out for their rights and privileges and all the other stuff. So they had to take care of themselves. And of course, the Catholics understood this as well. I mean, that was pretty clear that they couldn't count on on the uh, the crown, but they also couldn't count on the rules necessarily, and they couldn't always count on their civic leaders, who were more often than not, well, they're kind of willing to make a deal with the with the crown and with the other side because you know there's a little profit in it, and you know that's easier, and 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 so that that's how these secret societies kind of got going, is that they were really an effort, a normal free association, to defend local and community interest. Uh, the Orange Order, I think I mentioned that one earlier. That actually rose in response to something called ribbonism. And, and ribbonism was an interesting thing about ribbonism. <laughs> I always, this is one of the ones I've always loved. And, and the reason is, is that there was nothing really all that interesting about it. It was an, uh, an agrarian sort of secret society. And what they did is they, they organized uh, tenant farmers, uh, small landowners to try and defend their interest against the, uh, mostly against the Irish collaborators who were working for uh, British landowners. So you had these absentee British landowners, and, and oftentimes the people they hired were Irish to you know, watch out for their concerns. And these people were pretty nasty, and, and they felt they had to be, much in the same way that prison guards are often sadistic. You know, they, even though there really doesn't seem to be any profit in, them, uh, in it for them to be sadistic, they, they have the opportunity to be sadistic, so they take it. Well, the, the ribbonism actually grew out of something called white boyism. <laughs> Which I always thought was a great name for a group. You know, if you're going to start a secret society, call it the White Boys. And we're practicing White Boyism. That whole um, White Boy Summer business, you know, that it made me laugh, even though the whole thing was silly, but it had that same ring to it. But White Boyism was basically a secret society. And what they would do is they would go around and they would break the stuff of rich people. They did these little things. They would, um, you know, smash up their, their uh, rent collection offices. They would set fire to their barns. You know, they would do these little acts of, of insurrection. But the point of it was, was to make the cost high. And what they were trying to do was change behavior. You know, if you were a good landlord and you were a good overseer, you, you were good to the Irish people, they would be nice to you. And if you were not, well, then you would have trouble. You know, another name they had was, uh, I think, called Ghostly Sallies, which <laughs> the Irish have a lot of great names like this. 
Well, anyway, Rubenism grew out of this, and it was very much the same sort of thing. But of course, at this point, you know, you've got this conflict that is much more advanced. So you've got one secret society opposing the Orange Order. And so these guys would do things like organize riots and disrupt each other's organizations. So you had this sort of two almost guerrilla outfits, but they weren't shooting at each other necessarily. They were doing sort of soft type of stuff, you know, the kinds of things that would create havoc with the other side, embarrass them, uh, cause doubt, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. That's the kind of stuff they were involved in. And it was highly effective because it ground down the other side. That's the important thing of any kind of secret society is that you know, when you're talking about uh, in this kind of conflict, is that its purpose is to lower the cost of resistance and increase the cost of, of oppression. And that's what these guys were up to. And you can look them up. It's, it's called ribbonism. And, and the name ribbonism comes because they wore a ribbon to identify each other. And they would change up the colors and had different schemes for it. And I've always thought that that was something that our side really needs to get better at, is understanding the value of secret societies, getting together regularly, locally, and then networking with other secret societies, and, and doing so not with your, your mobile device, not doing it on text or Discord, and not doing it online. Online's not real. It's fake. It's doing it in person. I mean, after all, the IRA did not largely win the revolt against the British because they were really good at memes. They didn't win because they were really good with Twitter. You know, they won because they went out there in the streets and they did things. But the other thing it does is it builds fraternity. You know, I'll get to this in a minute, but being in opposition is tough. It's painful. It's lonely sometimes. Lots of our people have complained about us. We've had guys commit suicide because they felt as if they, they just had no friends. They had no support structure. And what secret societies do is it gives you sort of this motivation to build fraternity and build brotherhood and, and put that support structure in place so that you can look around and see a guy who's struggling a little bit and come and help him out. But ultimately, the purpose of these is to overthrow the overseers. I mean, the Sons of Liberty in the early America, this was a secret society. This was an important part of resisting British rule. And it's funny, you know, the British are always, <laughs> every time they lose, it's somehow a secret society involved. But that's what the Sons of Liberty do. They would do things like they would organize a protest, create all kinds of problems, you know, make a bunch of noise, and then disappear. They would all disperse quickly before the authorities would come. And what were they doing? They were just constantly grinding at the oppressor, constantly making the cost of, of their oppression high on them and low on the other side. And of course, it builds morale. That's why I oppose all this stuff being out on the streets and marching around and these idiots waving flags and all that stuff. That, that does the opposite. It makes it easy for the bad guys to score a lot of easy points at low cost. And at the same time, it increases the cost of being in, in resistance. And the Irish, they understood this. They understood how important it was that the math has to keep working in their way because they were small and the other side was big. And so you can't trade one for one. You've got to constantly be making the other side trade 10 for your one. Now, another important lesson for us, and this is very important, and I, it's, I think people are starting to come around and understand what's happening to us and, and uh, you know, understand this point, but that these kinds of conflicts, especially when the identities of the, the warring sides are realistically much closer than either side is willing to admit, they get nastier over time. This is something that Thucydides actually wrote about extensively with the Peloponnesian War, that the longer the war went on, the more vicious and nasty the sides became. And you see this with the, the Irish and the English. In the early parts of it, yeah, you've got some people, who, you know, obviously there was violence, and violence is much more common in 17th, 18th, 19th century. But the violence levels were relatively small, you know, relative to the conflict. But over time, it came more and more violent, more and more nasty, more and more sadistic. You, know, you read stories from the Troubles themselves, that period in the 20th century, and, and the things that the English would do were monstrous. There's no question about it. And they were often used in the American press to gain sympathy for the Irish. But the Irish did horrible things as well. I mean, torturing people, killing men, women, and children who were, you know, completely un, unconnected with the conflict. These things were done because over time, both sides become more vicious and they, they dehumanize the other side. And we see this happening today. All this stuff with January 6th, a lot of people are missing this, but the uh, over-the-top sadism that is going on, they are literally torturing men in jail right now by doing all kinds of monstrous things to them, you know, making sure they get beat up, have the guards come in and beat them up. They put them on lockdown for whatever reason, you know, they isolate them from each other and from their families and 
It's a deliberate regime of torture, not because they got information or they're trying to send a message. They're doing it because they enjoy it. They're doing it because it's fun. I can tell you, I know, I've talked to someone recently who has some insider access to some of this stuff, that people in Washington are laughing. They're laughing about the misery that these people are suffering from in, in uh, prison because of this January 6th stuff. They think it's funny. And that's an important thing for our side to kind of get our minds around, is that you know these people are trying so hard to impose their will on society. And of course, they're trying to make reality you know, comport with their bizarre fantasies. And the more they fail at it, the more frustrated they come, the more sadistic and deranged they're going to get. You know, they're, they're not going to be uh, swayed by appeals to their humanity. And that, that's, an, that's an important thing we have to understand, is that over time, the people in charge are going to get more sick. They're going to get more deranged. And we have to be prepared for it. You know, that means, you know, avoiding courts. <laughs> you know, that's one of the great lessons of the last five years, six years, whatever it's been, is that the rules no longer apply. And so you can't expect to get a fair trial if you've, if you've done the right thing and some uh, lunatic attacked you on the street wearing a black hoodie, well, you, you have no chance of winning in court if it ends up there. So we have to organize ourselves in such a way, you know, these secret societies and our get-togethers and how we, we try to proselytize, uh, you know, in favor of our cause, but do so in such a way that makes it very difficult to be drug into a courtroom or any other kind of system. And, and that's because power corrupts. That's an important part of this conflict. The British became much worse people because of this. And the collaborators, you know, the, many in the Irish elite, they became much worse people. You know, it, it, you know, when you are start taking money, you say, well, you know what, I'm going to monetize this conflict between my people and, their, and this occupying force. There, there's no limits after that. You were willing to do anything. And you, we see this happening today. You know, this Mackey trial is a perfectly good example. You've got Douglas Mackey, people don't remember him. He was a guy who uh, was the Twitter character, Ricky Vaughn. Ricky Vaughn, of course, was a character from the movie Major Leagues, which I think was like the 1990s or something. And I, I'm guessing that Mackey's probably in his late 30s, early 40s, something like that, based on the, the reference and also pictures I've seen of him. But anyway, what he did on Twitter was make fun of people. He made sport of them. He, he mocked their their platitudes and their piety, and he, he made fun of all their little heroes. And he didn't break the law. There's no, no reasonable person could think that he broke the law. But most likely, he's going to be found guilty because the judge is rigging the case against him. For example, the judge is allowing secret witnesses. The FBI has a secret witness that they're going to bring forward, spring in the middle of this trial. The defense has no opportunity to, to prepare for this. They're not even allowed to know who the guy is. Well, this is clearly a violation of the basic principles of civilized society. You should always be able to face your accuser. And look, I agree with Paul Ramsey here that the guy, the secret witness is either Chris Cantwell or uh, Paul Whelan, I think his name was, the guy who ran for Congress in um, uh, Wisconsin. My guess is it's one of those two. And, and the reason is they doxed Ricky Vaughn. They were the guy who did it. And of course, Cantwell has been in the can in and out of uh, prison. And he's an idiot. He'll, make, he'll take whatever deal he can. But it doesn't matter. I mean, that this judge is, you know, he, he likes his position. He's like all the collaborators that uh, of the Irish who worked with the British, this guy is saying, you know, he's a Trump appointee, by the way. This guy is saying, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to make sure Mackey is guilty because that's good for me. That's where my bread is buttered on. And and he's also um, he allowing his witness intimidation business to go on. I guess one of Mackey's witnesses was a guy, is a college professor named George Hawley out of Alabama. He wrote a number of books on the whole alt-right thing and the populism and Trump and that kind of stuff. And my understanding is I know some people who know him, not, they're not his buddies, but they know of him. And basically his politics are middle of the road. He's not really you know, into this kind of politics. What he is is a guy who's observing this and he writes about these subjects and, and part of his academic career is about studying this stuff. But they, the court is allowing the SPLC to harass this guy and keep him from testifying in court on, on, uh, as a part of Mackey's defense. This is monstrous what's going on. But again, the judge has to do this because, well, the people with power, with real power, who have real money, they control his life. They can make him not a judge. The same thing's happening in the J6 uh, trial, I think, with the Proud Boys. You had the FBI release documents to accidentally to the court where uh, it was just messages where they were talking about destroying exculpatory evidence and not giving it to the defense and also how they would frame these people if they needed to. And, and the judge just ruled that, no, no, you can't use that. You know, you're not even allowed to talk about it in court. It really is incredible what's going on. But that, this is the important thing is that 
it, what happens when you're occupied by foreign people is that they immediately begin to corrupt your native institutions. And this is exactly what happened with the British and the Irish. They even tried to infiltrate the church. And that became a big part of how the, the, the Irish did resist is that, you know, making sure that that institution was not being corrupted. It wasn't getting money from the British crown and it wasn't attached to the British in a way. It didn't benefit from it. And, and we have to keep that in mind is that all these people, you know, rich guys who come around, sniffing around, talking about our ideas, most likely when it comes time to choose between you and, and their comfortable life inside the, the, the regime, they're going to, they're going to pick the comfortable life. So you always have to keep that in mind. Struggle is hard. And for many people, to mix my metaphors here, it's a lot easier just to take that blue pill and go back inside the matrix rather than continue to fight the system. Now, another lesson here, as I'm getting close to my, the end of my time here, is that one of the things that made the IRA successful and made this final push for independence successful is that it, it took a while. But eventually, the, the Irish nationalists came to understand the nature of the struggle and the only way it could possibly progress, but also the nature of the other side. You know, they stopped thinking they could make a deal. They stopped thinking that they could convince the other side of the righteousness of their cause. You start reading about this stuff, you see this back and forth. It's almost like the uh, the arguments that you have gone on between civic nationalists and dissidents. You know, dissidents will say, look, you can vote yourself silly. It's not going to make a difference. Yeah, but Ron DeSantis is mean to Mickey Mouse. You know, I mean, you go back and forth like this. Well, this same kind of dynamic went on for a long time with the Irish. You know, there were plenty of people who saw the easy way out, the, the fast way out was to make whatever deal you could make with the English. And then the other side looked at this and said, no, 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 you're, you're making a deal with people that can't be trusted. They're not making a deal in your best interest. They're making a deal in their interest. And their interests are in conflict with your interests. And it was always this, this sort of back and forth in there. And again, we see this happening in our own space. That's why it's it's a good idea to not get too mad at Normie. And, you know, I, I called uh, Normie a sack of potatoes, you know, the suburban peasant. And that's because... He's got enough, you know, um, skin in the game to feel as if he, he can't really break, make a break with it. And that, you know, he convinces himself that, well, you know, if I just vote, you know, if I vote for DeSantis or I vote for whoever, you know, I, I forget who else is running now. There's that Vashwami guy, <laughs> you know, that, that'll that make a difference. You know, there's always some excuse to not do the hard work of resisting. And and, that's, and there's going to be lots of people who can never come around to this. But what happened with the IRA is they finally started to understand this. They understood that, you know what, there's always going to be people on our side who are lo looking to cut a deal. So we need to change the rewards and you know, the, the punishments and benefits such that that's discouraged. And really what they were doing or trying to do is starve the British of those people who would collaborate with them. And, and in our time, we, we're not going to be setting bombs off or assassinating people. Let's hope it doesn't get to that just yet. But, you know, on our side, a lot of this means that we just break ourselves free of these people. We do not engage with people who are constantly telling us, you know, we have to go back to our constitution or that kind of stuff. Arguing with them actually rewards them. Ignoring them or mocking them, making fun of them, well, that kind of discourages that behavior by taking the benefit away from it. You know, there's no one around to clap for them when they point the finger at you saying that you're a racist or a homophobe or whatever, whatever they're transphobe, whatever the conservatives are into now. And, and that's, you know, a way in which to, to prevent that is to not be around them, you know, to not give them an easy foil. But I think the ultimate lesson from the IRA and any of these other kinds of movements, though, and any of these sort of resistance movements that we as dissidents can draw is that you have to think like a minority. You have to, you're, you're not the majority. You know, the great mistake of what we call the right in America for my whole lifetime is the belief in this fantastic force, this magical, invisible army of the silent majority. This group of people out there that existed, you can't see them. You know, they're not there at uh, breakfast with you. They're not there in the conference room, but you know they're there. They're, they're hiding in the shadows, this silent majority. And if you go out there and you, you rattle your pots and pans and you, uh, you point out the, the bad things that are happening, this silent majority will rise up and uh, save the day. It, it's never risen up and it's never saved the day. If anything, it winds up making things worse. You know, think about the Bush years. George Bush was elected based on this silent majority argument. Lots of people said, well, you know, yeah, we're going to we're going to return to normalcy. And what we got was a bloodthirsty lunatic. You know, eight years of, of monstrous wars, and, you know, government growing like a weed. We have a police state now. I mean, George Bush was a horrible. And it's because we bought into this idea that, hey, you know, we just get people in the office who are like us or seem like us, normal people, you know, members of the silent majority. Things will be fine. 
And the IRA, they disabused themselves of that. The, the, you know, the rebels started thinking like guerrillas, acting like guerrillas, and understood that they were a minority that was going to have to undermine this system in order to open a vacuum in which they could flow into it and take control of their society again. And that's how we have to think of ourselves. The dissidents need to think of themselves as, you know, we're, we're daywalkers. We're, we're people who are a part of this underground resistance movement who walk around during the day and we're seen as just normie like everybody else. But when we go into the shadows, you know, our fangs come out. And that, that's how we have to think. And and all those, you know, normie people around trying to convince them, that's eh, not a, not really a lot of benefit to it. All we have to do is make sure that they don't they don't see any benefit in, uh, in opposing us. And, and that most of that can be done by simply ignoring them or on occasion mocking them. All right. Well, I've got a few minutes left here. Uh, what I wanted to get to, though, and I'll make sure I have time for, is what actually happened to the Irish afterwards. You know, when you read the Irish story up until the end, it sounds great. It's a fantastic story of nationalism, of not just ethnic nationalism, but religious na- nationalism. I mean, these people were Catholic. They, they made Catholicism an integral part of their Irish identity as Irish rebels. And yet, as soon as they've got essentially independence, church attendance began to collapse. They began to embrace all the garbage stuff that we look at in our society, abortion and transgenderism and homosexuality and sodomy. And, you know, Ireland right now, the Irish government has a goal of importing a million Africans on top of the ones they've already imported. In other words, they want to replace themselves with Africans. I mean, it sounds ridiculous. At one point, they elected, I'm not sure what the office was, a prime minister or something like that, a gay Indian. I mean, everything that the Irish fought for, as soon as they had the opportunity to grasp it, they gave it all away. They immediately started to embrace all this, you know, globo homo stuff. Shen Fen politicians now sound like grievance studies professors at a third tier state college in America. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. These people are are vulgar now. They're disgusting. They're everything. You're the exact opposite of what everything they pretended to be. But here was the problem is that much of what they they embraced as an identity became a a negative identity. They were simply the opposite of the British. They weren't for something. This long period of uh, of conflict slowly ate away that positive aspect of their identity, of what it meant to be Irish, what it meant to be Catholic, what it meant to be an Irish Catholic. It's not exactly the same thing. Being Irish Catholic has properties that are not necessarily possessed by Catholics or just Irish. This sense of identity, that, that positive identity that is independent of all external forces, was slowly gnawed away and eroded and replaced by a negative identity. And that negative identity is whatever the opposite of the British are, whatever the opposite of Britishness is. And so this you know, uh, new independent Ireland, these new independent Irish nationalists, well, they looked and said, you know what, there was... British conservatives, the dominant group, they're not really all that happy with Europe. They're skeptical about European continentalism. So we're going to be for that. There's lots of people in the conservative side, you know, the the Margaret Thatcher wing of uh, the uh, British political elite. They're skeptical of globalism. So the Irish are going to be globalists. They're skeptical of a lot of these social fads where we're going to embrace all this stuff. In other words, they didn't have agency of their own anymore because everything about who they were was entirely tied to this external force, this other people. And in effect, what they had done is they put a leash around their neck and handed the other end to somebody else. And and that's why, you know, Irish nationalism is a complete joke now. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. A very similar thing is happening in Scotland. The Scottish uh, Nationalist Party, SNP, I, if they haven't done it already, I believe they're getting ready to, the guy who's going to be in charge of it, the uh, the, the guy who's going to re- replace the fish lady who was uh, just resigned, is a Pakistani, uh, I think he's like an Urdu or something like that, a Muslim, who has regularly said the problem with Scotland is it's full of Scots. I mean, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. But that's the problem with this negative identity. When your identity is completely around, uh, built around opposition to this one thing, when that one thing goes away, well, what do you have? Well, you don't have anything. And so that empty vessel is immediately filled with whatever's around. And what happened to the Irish is it was filled with globalism, American globalism, Westernism, this sort of you know, sterile, you know, culturalist consumerism that's built around basically consumer goods and uh, you know, leisure items and uh, lifestyle choices. You know, that, that's what filled the gap. And so the Irish, you know, the Irish nationalists now you know, look like members of a gay pride parade. And of course, the same thing is happening to the Scots. You know, they're they're becoming sort of a, a caricature of nationalism. 
And, and look, this is true all over Europe. You're seeing these nationalist movements. Many of them are glomming on to, you know, they're supporting the United States in the war in Ukraine and, and Europe and uh, NATO. They're, they're jumping on board all these globalist organizations that would grind them into dust tomorrow if given a chance, simply because, well, they, they're on the, uh, the Russians are on the other side. And so this idea of who they are is not really pro-Finnish or pro-Estonian or pro-Danish or whatever. It's simply being against stuff. And for the longest time, they could be against, in, in the abstract sense, you know, the EU and immigration and things like that. But now they got this really cool thing, this ancient hatred of Russia. They can be anti-Russian and it's safe. You can do it in the streets. It's great. And, you know, people who used to hate them, we now pat them on the head for being anti-Russian. And it feels good. But, of course... What, what's happening is, is that they're allowing this negative identity to really turn their virtues into vices because they're supporting a side in that conflict that when they're done killing the remaining Ukrainians, they're going to turn around and say, well, let's get rid of those Finnish nationalists, those Estonian nationalists, those uh, whoever else, the French nationalists, you know, various people. And that's the danger of a negative identity. Positive identity is independent. A true Finnish nationalist is someone who understands what it means to be a Finn and if all the people of the world disappear after that, his identity as a Finn remains because it's not dependent on everyone else. It's only dependent upon him. And that's that's the lesson, the big lesson to draw from the Irish nationalism is that you can't go down the road of negative identity. It can't You can't start with, here's my list of complaints and who I am is a guy who opposes these things. You got to start with, this is who I am. And I happen to co- oppose these things because... They are contrary to who I am as whatever I am. And, and that, that's an identity that can survive conflict and come out the other side as something positive that people can rally around and can actually develop into something that is you know, long lasting and sustainable. All right. Well, I've gone on long enough. I, I hope everyone is going to enjoy their St. Patrick's Day weekend. It's always, a, it's always good when St. Patrick's Day falls on a Friday. At least when I was a young man, it was a fun time to go to the bars. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your weekend and I will be back next week.